Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Ben Donenberg, founder and producing artistic director of Shakespeare Center of Los Angeles. Donenberg has performed as an actor on and off Broadway, on television and in films, and he has been a unit producer for feature films, as well as producing more than 50 professional theatrical productions. The nationally recognized Shakespeare Center holds a unique place within the constellation of arts organizations in Los Angeles and in the United States. And Ben has generously agreed to share some of his experience in founding this wonderful organization uh, with us, and I'd like to thank you, Ben, for joining us today. My pleasure. So, Shakespeare today, Shakespeare today, you must have heard this question so often. Aye. Aye. <laughs> so, let's talk a little bit about the relevance of Shakespeare in today's world where our children and, and ourselves are bombarded with, with uh, incredible diversity of, of sensory um, overload, ranging from video games to 3D movies with the 3D televisions place you within stadiums. Um, Shakespeare now is in competition with other uh, forms of entertainment and art uh, like at no other time. Let's talk a little bit about Shakespeare's relevance today and Shakespeare's competitive place within this very rich market today. Um, you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking I have a 12-year-old boy and a 6-year-old boy. My 6-year-old this week discovered the Three Stooges, and uh, my 12-year-old is reading T.S. Eliot and Sherlock Holmes, and every Sunday they engage in a ritual battle over the Xbox, and uh, it's been a, a real interesting journey to observe my young boys grow up kind of pummeled by all of this visual stimulus. And what I'm really proud of is when they come to a Shakespeare production, they listen. They listen and relate to people on stage in a very different way than they do at any other time during the day and week. Um, and so I kind of take my lessons and cues from my kids at this point. And it's a real joy to have them come to live theater and sink in to the world of spoken word and sink in to watching human beings live, real time, working on their relationships and working on their problems. And both of them understand it. Because if, if it's really well done, you are actually within the set of the piece that is being performed. Shakespeare is so enveloping because of the rhythm of his language. Um, there have been a lot of studies, and there's a wonderful article called The Neural Liar, Liar, L-Y-R-E, that um, proposes we're hardwired from birth to appreciate rhythm. And Shakespeare's rhythms, the rhythm of his language, mirrors the heartbeat. Iambic pentameter is da-dum, 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 da-dum. And so it will typically take an audience five or ten minutes to sink in to the rhythm of a play um, with Shakespeare's language. But once they're in, Shakespeare carries you as if you're riding a wave. And if the rhythms evolve and grow and accelerate and the tempo is consistent with what Shakespeare desires, you're captured. And you do. You become a part of a world. And you leave the world that you're in and two and a half hours later, you've been on a journey with a group of very talented, open-hearted, rich artists that have carried you to a new place. And then when Shakespeare's language breaks uh, uh, with uh, iambic pentameter, 
it basically, it, it, it's like being, being hit on the, uh, on the head a little bit and it, it wakes you up and, and it makes you pay attention and you shift. Let's shift a little bit. Let's, let's talk about what you're doing now. I remember sitting with you in a restaurant and, and you were saying, I, I had no idea that, that, that this, is, well, this was, was what was going to the happen. Trajectory, yeah. The trajectory. The so, trajectory. So let's talk about your, your genesis, how you started and where you are today. Shakespeare, Shakespeare in particular was my savior in high school. Um, my, my father had died and I was really uh, depressed and I was assigned to watch Laurence Olivier's Hamlet for extra credit on PBS and a ghost of Hamlet's father appeared and I was really rattled uh, in watching Hamlet wrestle with the conversations and relationships that he was having with the ghost. And so I, I started with a real emotional resonance with Shakespeare's plays. Um, and then I was very lucky to move through the National Shakespeare Company and then to Juilliard with Michael Langham, who is one of the greatest Shakespeare directors in the English-speaking world, and um, just really found myself getting deeper and deeper and deeper into Shakespeare's world. And so when I moved to Los Angeles and there wasn't a Shakespeare company here 25 years ago, I thought this could be a real contribution to this community to create um, an institution that would promote and illuminate the wisdom of these plays in a way that was not present in Los Angeles. And so I built the organization with the help of a lot of wonderful supporters and a lot of artists who also early in their careers found themselves resonating with Shakespeare. And that's one of the great things about Los Angeles is there are so many actors who started out working with Shakespeare and love returning, and he's a touchstone for so many people. Um, and so I sort of built the organization around those people and my vision. And as the community stepped up and became more and more appreciative of the access I've been able to create with Shakespeare's words for people to better understand themselves, and understand their community and the aesthetic that has evolved. You know, I, I now produce and direct Shakespeare that reflects the history, the landscape, and the people of Los Angeles. Shakespeare talked about holding the mirror up to nature and reflecting the very age of the time. And a lot of the work we do with Shakespeare's texts, going back to the Oxford English Dictionary and glossing these words and understanding what Shakespeare meant when those words were first used. If you look at the word very, it means exact. Shakespeare wants you to reflect the exact time and the people who are coming into the theater to see those shows. So rather than opting for a distant mirror, um, we like to um, talk about the Shakespeare Festival as having a picture of a pair of tights with a red circle and a line <laughs> through it. We never, we never produce Shakespeare in Elizabethan England. We produce Shakespeare in Los Angeles. And we've put him on Central Avenue in the early 20s with jazz. We've put him in the San Fernando Valley with Beatles covers. We've done timeshare Shakespeare with Taming of the Shrew. We're, we find ways to really open the plays without messing with Shakespeare's text. Um, so that people see themselves in the, in the play. And you're asking, why is Shakespeare relevant today? Shakespeare understood a core fundamental um, principle. And that is, people do not see things as they are. People see things as the people are. We see things as we are, not as they are. So every time you look at something, it's filtering through you. And it's your reality that you're projecting onto whatever the occurrence or event may be. Shakespeare understood that from fundamentally. We've been working with creating 
contextual representations of Shakespeare's world in ways that kids and students and teachers and adults and seniors can all see themselves in. And that's, that's the real access point, is this interpretive accessibility. You can make Shakespeare accessible financially, but unless you've taken an interpretive position that says, this is about you today, um, you're fighting a battle that is going to be eclipsed by Facebook and movies and Xbox and all that. So Shakespeare is contemporary. Well, whenever I hire a director, I say to him, you know, this, this playwright named Bill Shakespeare walked into my office today and threw this play down on my desk and said, this is about Los Angeles today. And then I'll take the director to um, South Central Los Angeles, I'll take them to East Los Angeles, I'll take them to the Veterans Administration where there are veterans from wars living and on medication, trying to cope with the issues that they've dealt with. Uh, I'll take them into Beverly Hills along Rodeo Drive. I'll take them all over Los Angeles and then ask them to come back and talk to me about how this play is about the field trip we took. Well, it's so interesting because what you've done is you've also exploded the walls of the theatrical institution. You've basically taken the theater into life as opposed to creating a barrier between uh, theater and life. Art is integrated into everyday life and we're losing constituents. Why is that happening? It's happening because artists have a sense of entitlement and artists don't want to hold themselves accountable, not all artists, and not everywhere, but I see this inclination among artists to really expect that their specialness, and they are special, but their specialness deserves entitlement. They create art for art's sake and they don't want to take into consideration the responsibility for their self-expression to a community at large. And when I say at large, I mean a populist community. Of course, you can have 12 or 15 or 100 or 250 friends who all share your perspective and will buy tickets every time you get up and do your show. So you're preaching to the converted. But you're pre preaching to a choir. I see art as an opportunity to engage a much broader constituency and not lose its integrity. But that's hard. It's hard. It's hard to go out to people who don't naturally come and buy tickets. It's hard to go out and, and bring people in who might be who not, not, might not be aware, might be resistant, that's hard. That it's very hard, and with Shakespeare it's particularly hard because there are all of these stigmas attached to Shakespeare with the language and the highfalutin and this and the that. But it's, it is the real thing that an artist really needs to do. Yeah, it's hard. What, why shouldn't it be hard? What isn't hard? Everything is hard. Everything is a challenge. But if you're going to make art, Make it for people, not for yourself, and then you forward the, and you advance the constituency for arts, and you build an understanding and a desire and a market. Well, it's also not remunerative. Building markets are not, is not remunerative. Harvesting markets that are already there, not challenging people's preconceptions or, inc or, or inclinations, is, is far easier. Uh, so in a sense, there's also this economic thrust that we have right now that, that is also. Yes, we do. One of the things that I enjoy so much about my life is that I have a position that demands the understanding of the creative spirit and the physical needs for sustaining an institution. I have to do both. 
you know, but in life, every person's heart has a spiritual yearning and every body needs nourishment. And the question is, are those two separate things or are they really one? To live you need nourishment and to make life worth living you need spiritual nourishment. Right. One of Shakespeare's greatest gifts is that speech of the seven ages of man and all the different ages that a person goes through. They have physical needs and you could even say financial needs, logistical needs, fiscal needs, and they have spiritual needs. And a great art institution needs to address both of those as one. So, if you're going to build a market, but you're only going to rely on the people that you already rely on, you're not really growing. What you're doing is stagnating and falling into status quo, so your spirit is not going to be joyful and rewarded. You lose focus. And so many arts organizations are now crimping and stifling artistic exploration because they're so focused on fiscal realities that they're confronting, but they're looking at them through very small lens. And they're trying to hold on to models that are evaporating because of technology. And so art, live theater, spoken word, needs to address this by making the things on stage so much about you. What I think is so interesting is how boards and how people of very significant accomplishment in other areas come back to this idea of taking risk and advancing into, into new places and new audiences. How do you engage people in this vision that you just articulated for the role of theater, the role of Shakespeare um, in a, a place like Los Angeles? Or are they coming in and knocking on your door and... and uh... um, sometimes they come knocking. That's rare. Um, more often than not, they become engaged after being a witness or a participant in a program. Positioning Shakespeare as a resource is the real key to engaging many other constituents. People don't understand that art <laughs> can speak across so many platforms and particularly Shakespeare. So next month I have uh, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy coming to Los Angeles to try Hamlet. Try Hamlet's competency to stand trial for murder. So there, there will be a trial. There so will be a trial and I have the Los Angeles County Bar Association putting up two lawyers and I have the Beverly Hills Bar Association putting up co-counsel and they're gonna argue at the moment that ha Hamlet killed Polonius was he mentally competent or not. This is a resource this is an opportunity for lawyers and legal minds to wrestle with the notion of mental competency, right? For young people who grow up in the most severe economic conditions, positioning Shakespeare as a job opens you or opens the young people to a world they haven't discovered and then when people who are accomplished with many resources come and see the struggle that the young people have surmounted to wrestle with Shakespeare and make that a part of them, you realize almost anything is possible. Engaging people in the process of live theater, it's not so much about talking to them about, oh, come and invest in my play or come in and invest in my organization. It's Come be a part of a process that teaches you about yourself, teaches others about themselves, and creates a forum and a nexus 
for people to learn and grow together. Aren't you also creating a social network by bringing people to this common platform? Theater is an even more intense and intensely interactive environment. And in many respects, you're leavening this very traditional um, uh, form by making it contemporary and by pulling in uh, people and providing this platform and giving people experiences through the platform itself that they themselves shape. All art can do that, not just Shakespeare. If there is the inclination to make it about something bigger than ourselves, Tell us a little bit about, about what you're doing in terms of bringing new audiences and also uh, ensuring that the financial viability of, of the organization is strongly maintained. Tending to the needs of the artistic growth of the organization and the financial stability is the job of a bunch of stewards, staff and board, and we are in constant, exhilarating conversations about how to embrace each moment and turn it into an opportunity. So with Facebook, Facebook, we, we are now exploring having people become our friends and fans and meeting on Facebook first, but really culminating those conversations face-to-face, -face, live at a play. So you can have a conversation online, but the real gold is when you get to sit down next to someone in the theater and see the show. Right. So we, we position the social media as the appetizer ah. and the work that we do as the main course, and what happens after that is dessert. You know, it's that kind of uh, focus of using um, the technologies as a tool to help us financially. So if you meet free of charge and chat, then, and you like that person or you're intrigued, and then you can come see the show and you become a member of our organization, financially support us, because we've created a relationship for you. We're, we're, we're like a dating service. And you're moving also into a uh, revenue model that is going to, in the future, uh, increasingly complement the philanthropic uh, revenue that supports the organization with earned income. That, that's absolutely correct. Um, I have the good fortune of having access to very high profile um, actors who regard Shakespeare as a touchstone for them and that it was a part of their lives when they began their careers, then they achieve a certain amount of notoriety and a certain amount of financial security. They can take off a few weeks of their lives to replenish themselves with the work that they did at the beginning of their careers and find it very rewarding because we have a very carefully protected process for them. Um, but we've now, for, for 25 years, been raising a lot of contributed revenue and giving away free theater. We're switching that so that we're selling tickets to give away free theater. Right now, I'm in the midst of a production that is about 84, 85% towards revenue goals, you know, we have achieved 85% of our revenue goals, and we still have enough of the run to go to recoup all the investment. It's some of the best artistry that we have accomplished in our history. And we have a production fund, which is kind of a line of credit. Instead of going out and asking for contributions, putting on a play, giving it away, going back and getting more money, we now have a production fund. And we invest the fund in a production, we sell the tickets, we replenish the fund, we give away seats strategically to constituencies that we know need the opportunity to see live theater and can't afford it. It's not a come all, you know, come one, come all. What we've done is segmented the audiences carefully and we figured that about 60 to 75% of the people who are coming to free theater 
can pay. And they would still come if we asked them to pay, but because we didn't ask them to pay, they didn't bring their wallets with them. Um, and if the quality of the work is high enough, they're going to pay good money for that. Um, so we've identified constituencies that we really want to target to continue to see free theater. We're going to give some performances for free, and then we have paid. So we've changed our business model. Um, and it's very exciting to see it work, you know? <laughs> um, and internally, there's been a lot of challenges working with staff. Very frankly, there's been a kind of dependency on contributed revenue, and there's a new era dawning um, and a new level of consciousness. So we're taking staff to pricing institutes to understand how ticket sales and all of that works. We're assigning revenue goals to each staff member rather than just leaving it in the development department and on the boards. Saying everybody knows that if they spend money, they're a part of raising the money. That's a change in the way they think about their jobs. And the, and the motivation, the common motivation, is the love of the art and strengthening the institutions that, that bring this art to audiences. You know, for some of my staff, honestly, it's not the love of the Shakespeare Center as much as it is the self-satisfaction they derive in seeing young people grow and change. Um, this is a forum for them to do their life's yearnings. And we have for 25 years supported that with contributed revenue. We're not going to do that anymore. We probably could, but not if we want to grow and continue to be present in this moment and reflect the community that we're in right now. If we just did contributed revenue, we would stay locked in a small barrel and continue to do the one or two things that we do really, really well over and over and over again. But that's not satisfying to my spirit. And we need to grow, so we need to make money. And there are lots of different ways to do it. And we just need to, we're creating the plans now, the business planning and all of that, that will designate roles and responsibilities and expand job descriptions to each person has an assignment and a responsibility for revenue in one way or another. So we start with art, we end with revenue. Ben, thank you so much for bringing this organization to life. And thank you so much for bringing this art and sustaining this art to the people of California and the United States. And thank you for your insights. Thank you for letting me talk about it.